Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. It is the Saturday edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. Please keep us company till 10 o'clock. And I also have to tell you that right after the show, you need to be making your way to the Dome at Northgate. There's an amazing event taking place. And if you don't go, you're going to be missing out full time. On the show today, we're going to talk to Merit um, Tyson, I think it is, from the You Dream project team. He'll be talking about a group of teenagers who are involved in building a plane that has flown from Cape Town to Cairo. Also on the show is Shireen Dindar. She'll be talking about her book, I Was Hijacked and I'm grateful. So I think there's a big lesson that we're going to get out of talking with the author of that book. Right now, two gents in studio talking about the expo that is happening as we speak at Northgate Dome. They are Gokte, the expo director, and Mark, all the way from the UK. Assalamu alaikum, welcome to the program. Alaikum salam, alaikum salam. Thank you very much for inviting us. <laughs> My pleasure indeed. Thank you for taking time out of a very, very busy schedule to talk to us about this amazing event happening as we speak. Now, it started on Thursday and it runs till Sunday tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock. Um, why did you, you are the expo director, Gokte. Right. Yeah. Why do you feel that this Expo needs to happen here in South Africa. What's the benefit to both Turkey and to South Africa? That's a wonderful question. That's right. Uh, that's exactly that. Because of this question, we start wondering what we can do. And what we've seen uh, in South African market when we uh, observe, and uh, it was a two kind of uh, market we have seen: low price and uh, low quality, or very high price very high quality and we have in as a turkish uh, furniture or the textile even uh, we have quite a good qualities we can uh, present south africa and south african people and they don't need to they don't uh, they don't have to pay so much money for the quality really yep <laughs> and when you come believe me you will see your mind is going to blow up Okay, we hopefully after the show, I'm going to make my way over to the dome. But Inshallah. Mark, let's understand your role as far as the expo is concerned. Mm -hmm. What are you doing here in South Africa with Gokte and um, this amazing Turkish exhibition? Yeah, I've been working in the furniture industry for a number of years. And for the last sort of six to eight years, I've been working only with Turkish companies. So where are you based? Uh, I'm from the UK. I'm now based in Istanbul. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I partnered with, uh, with uh, another guy to, to make the exhibition. Um, you know, as I say, I really believe in Turkish Are furniture. Are you a furniture manufacturer? No, no. I, was, uh, I previously worked in the Middle East and set up uh, a furniture retail business and we sourced directly from Turkey and only from Turkey. Uh, I dropped contacts from other markets to move to Turkey because I found the the service I got was better, the prices were better, uh, and you know the style was, was a better fit for, uh, for the market that we had. Um, Gokte spoke about the low end of the market and the high end of the market, yep. so we've got a gap here in the middle. Yep. Is that the market you're targeting? I think it's an absolute perfect fit. I mean, the Turkish furniture industry, as we, as we mentioned earlier, is, is worth about $20 billion. Sure. About half of that gets exported, and Turkey is the dominant uh, supplier for the Middle East and North African region and the reason is it offers great value uh, it just slots it right into the, the, the bit we're talking about. Okay you're talking great value give us an idea and also I know that as we speak uh, we're going to see slides of the type of furniture yep. we're talking about and other stuff that is being exhibited at the dome mm -hmm. so um, would you like to talk a little about that and Gokte can also add his bit to the discussion. Yeah, well we've got we, we 
this is the first expo that we had, so we, we, we kept it relatively compact. So we only had a, a set number of places, if you like. It was done on a first come, first serve basis. But we think we've got a great cross section of, uh, of what the Turkey furniture industry could offer. So we've got children's rooms, we've got a lot of wow. sofa manufacturers, uh, bedrooms, dining rooms. We're covering all budgets and price points. We've, we've done a really great job. Uh, as I said, we've got about 40, 50 companies. From because Turkey, from obviously. From Turkey, uh, that's all we could do. You know, we, we had a set number of, uh, of, of places, if you like, and the companies were fighting in the streets back in, uh, back in Turkey. Trying they're to all get desperate to get here. Yeah, yeah, they're all <laughs> desperate to get here. Okay. And we, as I say, we think it's going to be a great fit for the market. My, my wife was a uh, South African, and uh, yesterday, uh, as we are getting ready, she will start walking with me in the dome, in the exhibition, and see, start seeing the uh, furniture. She said to me one stage, let me sit. I cannot take it more. Because she was overwhelmed she by the beauty so and the selection. We, yeah, she was looking for a couple of things for our house here. Yeah? In the meantime, because I know all of two in my fact, she's all my friend. I said, come walk with me and choose. And after the well, she said to me one thing. She said, please, Ty, let, let me sit. And because I don't know anymore. Because not believe me when you come. He's going to have to build an extension to fit all the things she wants in the house <laughs> okay. now. Okay, <yeah. laughs> that's exactly. So what else? We we focusing on furniture. Yeah. What's what is unique about f Turkish furniture? What type of wood do they use? What sort of colours are we looking at? Are they looking at world trends and uh, going along with those type of demands? Yeah, I mean some some of the companies that we've got are huge brands in Turkey, and as I say, in in the areas that they that they uh, the markets that they're they're in. Um, you, materials wise it's you know it's everything's up to date but what sets Turkish furniture apart is, is the design it has its own distinct style it's not plain you know when you come I mean I'm, I'm, I'm sort of harping on but if you look at some of the children's bedrooms you you love it you'll absolutely love it that's one thing they're really strong at but the dining rooms and the use of different materials, different textures, colours. It's that good it's wood, wonderful. are we talking about quality Very wood? High quality, because yeah. a lot of the stuff on the market, mm, like yeah, exactly. uh, Ty has just said, the low end mm, of the market, yeah. you're really getting almost like plastic or hardboard, uh, what's it? Hard, hardboard rubbish. Um, you know, one kick and the furniture yeah, yeah. just kind of crumbles apart. That's exactly is, uh, our point. That's, you know, your house, is, you need to be happy in your house. Say you bought a couch and uh, it's very expensive but material and you don't want your kids to jump on it because you're going to give it damage and you cannot clean or you cannot fix. Turkish furniture goes also there. You can clean, it's very strong, very good material and uh, when your kids jump or you're in uh, some, uh, something, your um, guest drops something, you're not going to get worried or angry or you're not going to say to your kids, don't go there, don't jump. That is the reason. We will, uh, so it's really hard wearing. hard wearing. That being said, Mark, and I'm glad you're here because you'll give us a perspective, a Western perspective mm. on this issue. Um, 21st century, all young people are wanting high tech, high fashion um, furniture and anything and everything else that yeah. they want to be surrounded by. But when I think Turkey, I'm thinking old world. I could be no. wrong. I don't know. No, 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 no. Not the furniture. The, furni um, the and, furniture and maybe is, is very, world class. Is it world class? It's and world I'm class. also thinking very Turkish designs with a very heavy brocaded fabric, etc. No, no, no. <laughs> it's very modern. It's very okay. modern. Believe me. I mean, in, in, in a previous life, when I was in, I was in Iraq actually, and we set up a, a large retail operation, the first question you get from the customer, is it Turkish? Mm -hmm. Because of it. quality. Of quality. All right, yeah. we'll come back to the furniture. I'm fascinated. I certainly am going to go out and look because I'm in the market for some furniture. What else are you offering at the exhibition? Uh, our service, our, uh, you will see the uh, Turkish hospitality, mm -hmm. because as you know, uh, one thing in the world makes us different as a Turk, uh, we like uh, misafir. Okay, and, uh, you're the visitor and you open your heart, heart and the door the for people. them. That is our cultural way, I yes. mean, it's uh, like you guys. You know, uh, when we go to one house, we're never gonna leave the people without the, having dinner. Absolutely. And that is our culture, our right. beliefs, our religion. Is, so you bring this expo here, you're talking, furniture is the big, um, uh, the big uh, draw card here. Yeah. What else are you showcasing at the exhibition? 
No, just the furniture. Only furniture. Only furniture. I'm thinking carpets, fabrics. Carpets, yes, it's going to be. Um, Turkish be. delights, like this lovely uh, Turkish delight box that you brought in for no, us. No, this one for the, our guests <laughs> is going to uh, g- give this as a just today because we believe if you eat sweet, you talk sweet. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Mark, what else can you tell me about the exhibition? You've been involved with um, Turkey in taking these exhibitions mm-hmm. around the world, I should imagine. What can we, South Africans, we're pretty used to exhibitions. Yeah. What can we hope to see differently and how are we going to compare in terms of pricing? Uh, the pricing will compare very favorably to what's available now. As Gok said earlier, um, they've, the, the impression that we get from the, the South African market is that you've either got great or not great, with not much in between. That's where we hope to fit in. So in terms of... Uh, Give us ballpark I'm figures. a Yorkshireman, right? I'm a Yorkshireman. <laughs> yes. One word's important to me, and that's value. Okay. And that's what you'll get with this, you know, in terms of the design, the materials, the, mm-hmm. the quality. Okay. Overall, value. I'm going to let you think about that so that you can come up with a couple of ballpark figures so mm-hmm. that we have an idea of, you know, what we're going to be spending and what else is attractive. Um, you did indicate that it's not only necessarily for business people, Mm -hmm. the general public can go as well. So we'd like to take families out and make a day of it and see what Turkey has to offer us as South Africans. Let's go for an ad break. Don't go away. We're going to be talking uh, some more about the Turkish exhibition, which is happening right now at the Northgate Dome. And the good news is that you can get your tickets off a quicket. um, And if you download your tickets, it is free of charge. You you know, that will allow you free entry into the um, exhibition at the Dome. Gokte and Mark are in studio talking about the Turkish Expo, which is happening at the Northgate Dome as we speak. They close off tomorrow at four o'clock. The Expo started on Thursday last week. Now, if you have nothing to do this afternoon and wondering how you can fill your time, Pull yourself away from the telly and make a trip, take the entire family and go to the Turkish Expo, which is happening at the Dome. I should imagine there's lots of uh, little stands where you can get refreshments, etc. So if you take the family along. Um, Opportunities for trade partnerships? Uh, yes, definitely. That's the reason uh, Turkish companies here. There's, there's an abundance of There's an abundance yeah. for that. And plus, uh, we have... Actually, uh, I believe myself with the South African creation design, if the Turkish uh, manufacturers come together, craftsmanship, uh, craftsmanship, (laughs) believe me, we can be a worldwide market for Mm -hmm. that uh, partnership. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I was busy with uh, with a couple of uh, South African uh, tech designs and designers. They have beautiful things, and if the two country idea if we can bring them together, we can uh, create a lot of jobs, a lot of job opportunities and creation from South Africa and then uh, all around uh, Africa or and around the world. We have, and I'm sure you, you've you told me off air that you've been in the country for 30 years. 30 years, that's You're married to a South African woman and she must have brought you up to speed as far as our industries are concerned. And with your years of being in South Africa, yeah. you must have made contacts and you know the market pretty well. Yes. Uh, a and you also do know that we have a lot of furniture manufacturers in South Africa. What can you offer to those manufacturers um, to give them the edge, perhaps? Yeah. As, as uh, what we've seen in the, our design and the, our finishing work is quite uh, good. Okay, so Mark, does that suggest then if you form a trade partnership Mm -hmm. with a local manufacturer, because um, Octay did say that, uh, Gokta, I beg your pardon, did say that this is an opportunity to create employment as well. Mm -hmm. Will the furniture get manufactured in South Africa or will it get manufactured in Turkey? And, you know, I'm thinking about the expertise, the Turkish expertise. Mm -hmm. 
It's a difficult one to answer. Uh, it would de it, it would depend on which company was partnering with with which company. I mean, in in terms of the opportunities that that are available, I mean, it could be a joint venture to bring the brand to South Africa. Some See, manufacture the here. Yeah, mm. or, or, or or ship the goods. It depends on on the size of it. You know, it might be a case of shipping goods first. If it's a success, you know, dipping a toe in the water, as we say, then they expand because it, Africa Africa's a potentially huge market. Uh, and the main thing is that they're here to do business. So any opportunity will be looked at, you know, seriously. Inshallah, that's mm -hmm. what's our. Uh, we talk about the unemployment problem not only in South Africa but worldwide and uh, young people are being pushed and encouraged to go the entrepreneurship route. Mm -hmm. This I should imagine would be an opportunity. Definitely, definitely. What is it that they need to and how do they present themselves to create partnerships when they come to the expo? Um, I, I mean it's like anything. If the <laughs> Attitude is a big thing. You know, if somebody if somebody hasn't got the ability, you can always train them. If they haven't got the attitude, then you've you know look. So if somebody comes or enthusiastic, they've got some good ideas, and if they can hit off, and create a relationship, then anything can happen. The big question, obviously, would be finances. So if somebody wants yeah. to create a partnership with a Turkish company, are they going to a South African be expected to come up with um, some sort of a down payment as far as finances are concerned? Um, down payment, uh, although right now is we really taught, is not, money is not the concern right now. That's not the Idea issue. and system. We are, the, the reason of our show is not selling product. The reason we came here to see the South African market, show the South African market what, are, what else opportunity is there. Because you've got a limited uh, options here. But when you come to show, you will see what you are missing and what is the other things in the world. That is, uh, is going to open wide, uh, quite wide uh, your ways. How have these expos taken off as far as the Turkish market is concerned? I know you said that you've been very active in mm -hmm. the Middle East as well, promoting these exhibitions. It's, Turkish furniture is already very known. Like, so you're, you're kind of... Uh, Oh, it's the right metaphor. You're preaching to the choir. You're preaching to the converted, <laughs> as we say. Yeah. In the Middle East. In the Middle East, yeah. Okay. Because as I told you, they love the Turkish food. Right, they can't right. get enough of it. So okay. it, it's a, when you do it to those markets, it's a case of going and showing the new product for the year, you know, the beginning of the year. Here, it's a new market altogether. So first of all, we've got to make the introduction and then we've got to try and develop the relationships. Okay. What can we expect to see? We've talked long and hard about furniture. Mm. Um, what type of furniture? I know you indicated bed room, dining room, kitchen, kiddies furniture, yeah. kitchen, kitchen as well? No kitchens. No kitchens. Okay. Um, and you also said that there's a small, um, probably a couple of stands, maybe um, showing carpets um, and what else? That's it, really. Accessories, it's some small accessories. Yeah, it's, it's, it's some of the manufacturers, for example, I can go back to the children's, they, they do the full thing, so they'll have the furniture, the mattresses, all the accessories, to, even wallpaper for some oh, of really? them. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay, they, they, can we buy off the show? Now, let's assume I'm coming can. just to look around. You I'm can. not interested in forming a, a business relationship with anyone. Yep. Would I be able to buy off the floor? You will. Yes. Okay. And if you like a deal, Come on Sunday, because all the display furniture has come on a one-way ticket. One way it's not going back. <laughs> oh, then I'm coming to see you guys. Yeah, do. <laughs> also, also if you can give orders and they can send it to you. Sure. I mean, it's uh, another issue point is uh, the connection and uh, seeing the South African test mm -hmm. and what they like, what they don't like. Okay. Well, one, one good thing I should mention is, is the flexibility of working with Turkish, Turkish companies. If you've got a retailer, for example, who's perhaps a little bit reticent and likes a little bit from one guy and a little bit from another, these people will cooperate, particularly if they're in, oh, if they're in the same city. Wow. That, you know, even if it's two sofa companies, you can take some from those guys and some from those guys and mix a container. So it kind of, it, it, it will turn a smaller company, it will increase their buying power. Okay, and I did ask you to ponder about the ballpark figures that we're looking at as, you know, the middle range furniture. Did you come up with anything or don't you want to hazard a guess? Uh, well, as I say, what we've got, we've, we've got a really good cross section. So we go from, let's say, the, the budget end to 
Premium. High end. Yeah, we, we've tried mm -hmm. to bring a real, a real cross section. How many exhibitors will be uh, are on the floor as we speak? Almost 60. 60, 60 row. 61, yeah. Majority being furniture. Yeah. Okay, um, so in closing then, um, was I correct in suggesting to our viewers that if they download tickets, entrance tickets mm -hmm. from Quicket, yep. they'd be allowed to come in free of charge. What Enforcing. happens if you don't come with a ticket? Would you still be able to go through? Okay, let's do that. Uh, okay, it's going to be free for everybody. So I can come without a ticket? You can come without a ticket. You can come. You can come. Oh, but the date is going to be, tomorrow is the first day we are starting, Thursday. Up to Sunday, 25th of August, is going to be the, our last day, up to 4 o'clock, uh, right. we'll stay there. And uh, just the furniture, when you come there, when you see that baby, beautiful baby rooms, maybe you will, ask, uh, you will dream another child because of the beautiful <laughs> room. <laughs> Why not? Well, wonderful talking to you guys. Good luck. So far, it's been great. You've had um, lots of people come through. Yeah. And hopefully, as people watch us this morning, um, haven't got plans for the weekend, will be making their way through to the dome, the Northgate Dome, to come and see what this is all about and hopefully make some amazing business contacts going forward. Thank you for being Thank with us on the show. <laughs> Salaamu alaikum to you. And there you have it, the Turkish exhibition happening at the Northgate Dome. Like I've said, take the entire family and if you're at a loose end as far as your business or your profession or your future is concerned, maybe this is the place to be. You might just make the right contact and start a little business of your own in partnership with a Turkish counterpart. Welcome back. I've been so excited to have our next guest on air. Her name is Shireen Dindar. She's from a small little dorpy called Brayton, but she's an amazing woman. And uh, she practices as a life guidance mentor and human behavior uh, education specialist. She's also an international public speaker and author. She conducts workshop seminars and one-on-one -on -one breakthrough sessions. So, so much to cover, but we ain't going to have enough time to talk about everything I'd like to unpack. I have invited her back again, perhaps in the next two or three months time when she comes uh, to Johannesburg, she'll join us to talk some more. This time around, I want to focus on her book. It's called I Was Hijacked and I'm Grateful. And this is what the cover of the book looks like. Um, I kind of wonder, how is it when people go through a traumatic or life-changing event? What is it, what is that one element, that defining factor that separates them, amazing people like Shireen, separates them from people like us who are just kind of stuck in a dark hole. Salaamu Alaikum. Wa well, Alaikum Salaam, Julie. Thank you for having me. My pleasure entirely. You've heard my opening statement. Mm -hmm. What is that certain something that differentiates you from me, allowing you to move forward and be in a place or a space of eternal gratitude? Okay, uh, that's a lovely question. So basically, Yes, you know, as we were talking earlier, you are in a dark space and you, you're there and you think to yourself, how am I ever going to get out of this dark space? And then, you know, you allow yourself to stay there for a while because you need to process, you need to go through the elements of whatever you've been through, the trauma. And eventually you realize, I can't do this anymore. I can't stay there. I can't stay stuck. I can't beat up on myself all the I time. I can't beat up on myself all the time. Is this where I want to be? Is this the victim mentality that I want to be, you know, stay in? And then you just realize one morning you wake up and it's, it takes a lot of energy, Julie. It takes sure. so much of energy to actually stay there. And I think that's what drains you because... You know, they say anything that weighs you down, anything that um, you haven't equilibrated in your mind that is not balanced becomes baggage. And so it's that baggage that weighs you down. And I think for me, it was, you know, it had come to a point where I realized I don't think I can walk around with this baggage for the next 
10 years, and 20 years. And we're stuck in a victim mentality. No, no. We're going to talk about your hijacking. We're going to talk about why you wrote the book. Okay. Um, I did, in the introduction, talk a little bit about uh, the type of work you do. Mm -hmm. But who is Shireen Dindar? Okay, so I wear many hats, um, but that still um, allows me to be me. <laughs> so Alhamdulillah, I, I started off as a, an education specialist, um, you know, English metric teacher, working in the FET department, um, colleges as an um, uh, education specialist, head of department, and uh, also running an entrepreneurship center for a department of small business development and um, um, the college. And so eventually, two years ago, when I did get hijacked, I was actually from, I think, 2006. I was introduced to Dr. D. Martini through my, uh, my CEO at the college, and it was actually a gift. And I then um, became one of his mentors. I mean, well, not his mentors, Mentee. mentees. Uh -huh. And I, I'm an advanced student of his, and I'm a D. Martini facilitator. So all along, I was basically practicing, um, you know, helping people change perceptions, equilibrate their minds, and get through whatever it is that they were stuck in, basically, you know, facilitating with Dr. Martini, the breakthrough method. And so about two years ago, I got hijacked. And then last year, I decided to, you know, take it to a different level. And I became a, a registered holistic counselor with the South African Council for Counselors. And I practice now as a talk therapist, taking th uh, people through trauma and death and divorce and um, well, child abuse, play therapy. So basically just getting, you know, people through whatever it is that's weighing them down. You were hijacked in Kensington, Johannesburg. Yeah. Talk to us about how that unfolded okay. in the moment and post the hijacking, which then led up to this book. But let's just, just, just give us a graphic picture of what went down. Okay, so it was a Friday afternoon, 17th February, 2017. And um, <clears throat> so we, as you know, I live 250 <laughs> kilometers away from Johannesburg. And I was basically coming to settle my son in and I brought all his- Varsity. Yes, okay. all his lock, stock and barrel. Right, right. And I brought like a whole lot of food worth and, you know, very excited. And um, my daughter was driving because she, wanted to drive because she lives, um, she studies in China and she wanted the opportunity to drive. Mother-in-law in the front, daughter in the uh, uh, driving and myself in the passenger seat. And so here we are Friday afternoon, get to my sister-in-law's house, uh, get into, into the in driveway Kensington. in Kensington, mm -hmm. get into the driveway. And um, for some odd reason, Julie, we didn't close the gate. Ooh. We didn't. And I don't know why. We all wanted to say, close the gate, close the gate, but nobody did it. And so here we expecting my son to pull in and we see, we hear a car and we look at them and, and we see these guys, um, a nice uh, BMW, and uh, they drive up. You know, it was like um, a driveway that you, you have to turn into our driveway. So they kind of got in there straight. And really, it was like a movie scene. I just remember looking at them. We thought it's new neighbors and we're like, okay, who are these guys? Oh, some new neighbors. And Julie, I can still remember that moment. My heart still pounds up till today. When I, when I think of that moment where I literally, you know, I see them walking, uh, running up that driveway. And you How know, many guys were there? There were three guys. And did they have any firearms? AK-47s. Oh my goodness me. <laughs> what? What? Apart from your heart almost uh, jumping out of your body, so to speak, yeah. what was going through your mind? You know, I, I, when I saw them run up with that, you know, that speed, and I, I heard them mumble, mumble something, it was then that I realized this is, I didn't think hijacking, I was like robbery, you know? But for me, it was, you know, it's either fight or flight mode. And for me, it was flight. I literally ran for my life. What about your children <laughs> and everyone around you? Did you not even give a thought to them? 
I did, Julie, but in that moment... You were in flight mode. I was in flight right. mode. So you see, and that's, you can't blame because you were in a state of shock. I was in a state of shock. Mm -hmm. I felt my heart pounding. All I knew is I had to get to safety. And yes, I did have moments of regret. I did have moments of guilt. But I had to work through that because now, in hindsight, I understand, I, I know why I did what I did. And there's no shame in, no. Uh, you know, you having reacted the way you did. Like you say, it's f uh, uh, flight or... Uh, Fight. freeze yes you know fight flight or freeze, freeze. exactly so it's one of those and you chose the one that just kind of came to you immediately what happened to your children and your mom-in-law that were in the car as well okay so my daughter obviously being young decided it was fight mode Ooh. so so she jumped back into the car and she decided I don't know what she was thinking, but she probably thought she would fight them. My mother-in-law was still in the car. My sister-in-law went around the car to go and help my mother-in-law get out. But by that time, the two guys had already come up the driveway with those AK-47s. I ran into the garage and I hid behind another car and I... I couldn't see anything literally, but my daughter had a, for her, it was very traumatic in I the sense imagine. that, you know, they put a gun to her head. They were pulling her, threatening to kill her, telling her to leave, I mean, to come with them. Um, the other guy went around to my mother-in-law and sister-in-law and, you know, they were looking for the key. They wanted the, the car. car keys. Yes. Mm -hmm. and so she who had, had them? My daughter had given it to her because she was going to uh, park it for us in such a way that it's out of the way. You know, because it's her driveway, so she knows how to do that. And so she had it. And, uh, well, when they found it, um, you know... Was they, anyone hurt in the encounter? No, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. nobody was hurt. It was when my, my daughter was having a fight with them, you know, a wrestling fight, you know. Um, I think she had her, her wallet in her one hand and she had a parcel in the other. And when her wallet fell, that's when she you know, took the opportunity to basically make a run for it. Mm -hmm. And um, he did hurt her a little bit. And she ran and she found me around the corner. And I just remember her saying, run, mama, run. So they then took the car and they made off with everything that was in the car, all yes. your belongings, and they were gone. Yes. Um, thankfully, nobody was hurt. Yeah. What happened right after that? And, and, and the reason I want to unpack all of this mm -hmm. is Sadly, very sadly, it's the times we're living in. And you kind of hear almost every second, third person or family mm -hmm. or someone in the community that has experienced either a home invasion, a robbery or a hijacking. And we okay. know, you know, common sense tells us how we should be careful. Mm -hmm. But sometimes common sense is not around when you are surprised yes. by a group of people with guns. So um, what happened after that is my mother-in-law and sister-in-law were, well, they took them and told them to sit down. Um, they took what they wanted from my sister-in-law. They got into the car. Um, I they remember, didn't go into the house at all? No, and that is the reason why I did not decide to go upstairs because I was afraid if they see there's a way you know, to get up, they'd probably follow me. And when I saw, when I heard my daughter um, say run, that's when I opened my eyes. I heard my mother-in-law praying. I, um, I continued praying as well. I did stand up at one stage to see what was happening. I saw his AK-47 um, and I think he mumbled something. And I just, I remember, Julie, it was so, when I look back, I clearly remember at that one moment, you know, when they say, submit to the will of Allah. I clearly remember putting my hands over my head, closing my eyes, and I just, I really submitted. The shahada. <laughs> I, no, I just said, um, whatever happens, happens, right, you know. Right. Yeah, probably that too. But I just, you know, I just, I just let go. And it was at that moment where I heard her and I followed her and I heard my sister-in-law scream, they took the car. And we ran up and, you know, we decided to phone. I couldn't, I was, I was totally out of it. My daughter had to grab the phone from me, make the phone calls. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law followed. And uh, yeah, there we very are. Very frightening, very traumatic, but very surreal at the same time. Absolutely. <laughs> you then decided um, at some point that you're going to write a book about this. But before we get to the book, right. what happened next? How did you guys calm down um, and kind of take stock of the situation? It was crazy. It was, I, I clearly remember 
my daughter screaming because my my nephews were in the house, but they were they didn't hear a thing. Mm. And so um, I heard her scream. We phoned my my mother in law and sister in law were in the house. After my daughter had made that call, she fainted. Oh, and you know she just passed out. And right. here we are. So like trying to keep calm, trying to get her to wake up, trying to get hold of my son not to come right now in case they're still somewhere. And then yes, the police came on. I think we, you know, alerted them and um, we made all the necessary phone calls. And then we were in shock. You know, I can, I can remember all the emotions. I can remember the tummy ache. I can remember the heart pounding. I can remember that nauseating feeling. And the anger. Oh my goodness. You know, it's like mixed emotions. It's, it's like you're thinking, did this really happen? How dare they? How did? Like really? And so, you know, you wait for everything to settle down and then you realize, okay, but maybe I need to be strong. Maybe I need to now get a hold of myself. So nobody's eaten. Let me give them some food. Let me give them, you know, we always have Try this. Try and go into like almost regular mode. Yes. Because yes. the regular mode, the, f the tea or the food's going to make everything right. Absolutely. And then when my daughter came around, you know, my, my mother-in-law always says some sugar water. You know, So I quickly went for that, gave, a, gave everyone some sugar water. And then we sat down and we tried to track the car and we did manage to track it down. But it must have been stripped, I'm sure. Um, yeah, not too bad, but we actually found the car late that night. We actually went and found it and managed to, you know, do all the necessary um, things that we had but to I do. But I suppose all your baggage and all the stuff that you brought for your son, everything was gone. Everything. You know what, what was the, the funny part is I wasn't so worried about the suitcases that I had, all, all his clothes, all the linen, all the towels, uh, our suitcases, our handbags. Uh, my daughter's phone was inside and that's how we managed to track the car. What got to me was the cooler bags of the food. food. <laughs> Let's go for an ad break. Isn't that where our hearts are always at? The food that we prepare with so much love for our families and all the food was taken away. Don't go away. We'll be back in a short while to continue our fascinating discussion with the lovely Shireen Dindar. I Was Hijacked and I'm Grateful is the title of the book by Shireen Dindar and she talks about the gratitude leadership. Shireen, after this awfully traumatic uh, event in your life, mm -hmm. um, do you believe at any stage that who you are, the craft that you practice, uh, you're a coach, you're a motivational speaker, um, a guidance mentor, etc. that that perhaps helped you heal quicker, perhaps? I would definitely say so, Julie, because um, initially I struggled, I won't lie. So basically I had to go for um, um, trauma stress reduction therapy. And so I went for trauma stress reduction therapy for a week. And, um, you know, that kind of helped me to get through, you know, using a different tech, uh, methodology. What is that methodology? Just give us a taste of it. Okay, so I'm also trained in trauma stress reduction therapy as a holistic counselor, basically taking you through the motions of what happened. And, um, you know, there's different techniques and methodology. So you can um, talk about your story and you, you know, the therapist takes you through the, the different steps of what happened. So you basically go back and and you, re, you know, you go um, into the story, but then eventually you, you, you say, you tell your story so many times that eventually it becomes a story, nothing more than a story. Right. But what about um, if you go into this type of therapy very soon after the event, mm -hmm. isn't it more traumatic for you? I, um, you know, it depends on the person. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that each person is different. So some people need time. Some people would take longer than usual to say, let me go and get help. Some people would think, you know what? I can't deal with this. Let me go and get help immediately. I think I probably took a week and then I went for this trauma stress reduction therapy. And yes, your question was, did it help me as a Martini facilitator, as a talk therapist? Did it yes. lessen the trauma for you or? 
I think it did because mm. immediately after I was, you see, it's easy to say I can, um, I know how to deal with this, but when you in it, you also need that outside support. So you that can't is, be objective in your own uh, absolutely. life. How did your family recover? Your so, uh, sister-in-law, mom-in-law, daughter, etc. So each one deals with it differently. My mother-in-law, um, she chooses not to talk about it. She chooses to just, um, you know, um, it's the reminders are, uh, uh, you know, a bit too, um, too painful traumatic and painful for her. And you got to respect people. Of course. Uh, my sister-in-law, she would talk about it. She's stronger. Um, and she kind of dealt with it in her own way. My daughter, on the other hand, up till now, um, she refuses to, 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 to go uh, and get any therapy because she this, feels that's her way of dealing with it. And this is two years later. This is two years later. Um, and obviously for you, the therapy did help. Yes, I... You then went on and decided to write the book I was hijacked and I'm grateful. After how long... Uh, after the event, did you decide to do this? And do you think that, that was, this was also a healing process, writing the book? Yes, so this is interesting. The, sto the, the book story is quite interesting. So after that stress um, reduction therapy... Which was a week after. Yes. Then what I had done is my daughter studies in China. She, she studies abroad and she had to leave literally in the week after the hijacking and it was very traumatic for her. So I had my, my therapy and I decided to follow suit and, and just be with her and, and, and you know, support her. So when I was there in China, I, I kind of took a sabbatical. It was, it was, you know, healing for me to be away from South Africa and the fear of being in South Africa because I just felt safer in China. And it was then that I sat down and because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a talk therapist and Demartini facilitator, I used the methodology. I used what I'm trained in to equilibrate my mind. And I sat down and I literally had to walk my talk you know, practice what I preach. And that's when I did the methodology on myself, taking myself through the motions, which took me about a month. And as I was making my notes and as I was writing down, uh, because the methodology we use is when I take people through whatever Journalize. it is. Yeah, yeah oh, no, whatever well. I kind of, you know, whatever yeah. issues people are experiencing, trauma, whatever. So I take them through um, a process where I show them Whatever has happened to you, how can you, in hindsight, be grateful Ooh, for the outcome? Wow. Okay. And that's when I, when I was journaling, like you said, I, I kind of realized, okay, but these are so many blessings in the crisis, but I just didn't see it. And that's when, you know, Allah Ta'ala says, um, with difficulty comes ease. And we don't realize, actually, Julie, within that difficulty, there is ease. Now, alhamdulillah, I mean, look, as you were talking about the guys with AK-47s, I was thinking one of you could have been killed, all of you could have been killed, yeah. um, your daughter might have been kidnapped, never to be found again. So there were so many horrible possibilities that could have come out of that. Mm -hmm. So I hear what you're saying about um, being in gratitude and as Allah tells us, um, you know, with every difficulty comes ease. the ease. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, so it took you a month to, to write this down. And as you were journalizing, you were seeing just how blessed you guys were, that you were saved from a far greater calamity. Yeah, absolutely. And that's when I always wanted to write a book. So I figured my hijackers were the catalyst. Right. They got me to stop procrastinating and I found a story. I had a story, but that's obviously just making light out of it. But in the sense that when I journaled, mm -hmm. that's when I realized I did, before I left on my mm -hmm. journey, make dua. I did make my salah. I actually asked Allah Ta'ala, protect me. And that is what Allah Ta'ala did. Absolutely. I was protected. And so as I you know, made my notes, I realized, okay, so here's a story. And when I found all the blessings in my crisis, and I found, because they say, whatever your mind and your body experiences, 
your soul can be grateful for. Absolutely. And that's when I decided to write this book. And also um, in my book, Dr. John D. Martini has written the foreword because it was literally taking his work and what I use on my clients when I do my talk therapy, you know, putting that knowledge into practice, applying it. And so I've put some guidelines down there and I wrote my story and Alhamdulillah, it, and that is why, and if you ask me now, that title, I, I truly am grateful because I wouldn't change it. You know, um, we are taught as Muslims that be grateful for what is as is. Do not impose man's will on divine will. And that is the outcome. So it wasn't as if um, I made dua and Allah didn't accept my dua. Allah knows the outcome of what it, whatever is going to happen. It's already in your tadir. It is already going to happen. However, you, I mean, those hijackers had free will. So it wasn't as if Allah Ta'ala told them, go and hijack her, you know. So they had the, cho the choice of free will. But Allah already knew the outcome. And that's where I realized the power of dua. I realized um, the weapon that we have to and use. And the power of shukr. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, I was hijacked and I'm grateful. I haven't read the book, uh, but just looking at the title, I would ask the question, I'm sure you get this question all the time. Mm -hmm. What are you grateful for? So I am grateful for the event happening because I grew as a person. My growth was phenomenal. I had this... How did it change you as a person? Okay, so I... I mean, it wasn't as if I was taking life for granted, but it's just the little things. So yes, we love, we have this immense bond and love for our loved ones, but I don't take things for granted in the sense that, you know, I'm fiercely independent. So there are times when I would say, I'm going here, I'm doing this, but now I would take the opportunity of asking my family, wouldn't you help me? Wouldn't you support me? And I realized the, the, um, the beauty of unity of bonding. I realized how little things matter, how when we pull for each other, I realized, yes, the power of dua. I realized how um, as a person, you know, where you put things off. Um, also, I think I've written in, if you see in my book, you'll see there's a thank you letter to my hijackers because I felt that they took away my sense of um, security. But I've been taught in my methodology as a holistic counselor, when I counsel people, I remind them, don't judge because whatever you're judging is a mirror reflection of what you have in yourself. So I learned not to judge people. So whatever it is that they had to do, they did. And that was the outcome. But I'm not here to judge them. So, and you're not trying to get back at them if ever you come face to face with them again. We've no. come to the end of the interview. Who should read the book? Well, um, anybody and everybody who wants to get insight into life and to realize that, you know what, um, life is not about the blame game. My mentor, Dr. John Martini, always taught me, um, take no credit, give no blame, keep focused on your chief aim. So, you know, if you want to understand that life is not about getting stuck there in that victim mentality and that if you don't want to age and if you want to curb the aging process, then don't allow baggage to weigh you down. So if that's where you are, get hold of the book and read it. Wonderful talking to you. I can't wait for you to come in again in a couple oh, of months time when we can Inshallah. talk about other issues. Thank you indeed for making the long trek all the way from Brighton <laughs> to come and talk with us. Jazakallah. Shukran for and, having me. Um, lovely to have met you. That was Shireen Dindar talking about her book, I Was Hijacked and I'm Grateful. And she talks about, she emphasizes the issue around being in a constant state of gratitude. Alhamdulillah. Welcome back. We have an amazing young man in studio with us. His name is Merritt Tyson. He's 18 years old and at the age of 17, he joined up with a few other young people and they started a project called the You Dream Plane Build. They put together a plane from scratch, which was then flown from Cape Town 
to Cairo. He's here to tell us about this amazing adventure. Not the flying of the plane, but the building of the plane. Morning, welcome to the program. Morning, how are you this morning? I'm good, thank <laughs> you. I'm amazed at meeting you finally. Yes. And um, I can't get over the fact that a bunch of young people in their teens got together and built a plane. Yeah. But this all started out, out by being involved with something called Smart Teens. Yes, yes. So, and you also subsequently became an ambassador for Smart Teens. Yes, that's How did you become um, involved with the Smart Teens workshops? Okay, so Smart Teens was founded by my mother and that's how I got to know about it. And then I attended it and I got involved and became an ambassador from the achievements I, I uh, did in my life. For example, I was really bullied badly in school oh, no. and I'd gone through quite a lot of that and um, I didn't want to get active in any any way. I was like a little bit overweight for my age, all this type of thing. And then I started to learn a whole bunch of mindset cha changing um, values and things and I learned how to... How old were you when the bullying started? I was I was still in grade six, seven, so I would have been, uh, I don't know, but uh, I was... I so was you're being teased all the time and possibly yeah, I mean, picked on? Yeah, I mean, I'm very tall and short, short people would bully me and I would and because I was always known as a gentle giant so mm -hmm. I would always be picked on in that way and uh, yeah like very a little bit of physical but not too much physical bullying but it hurt me a lot like I got bullied out of playing soccer 100% um, because I always wanted to play but nobody would allow me to because you know I wasn't good enough when I started um, and I just needed some time to practice. So those are the types of things I was bullied for. And what did, you know you were being bullied constantly at yes. school. What did you do about it? Did you go home and tell your mom about it? Did you tell I your teachers? Yeah. Were you too embarrassed about it? I think I was I was quite embarrassed at the time. Um, I didn't want to tell anyone about it. Not because I thought that they would bully me more or I would be attacked or something if I told them. Just because I was still trying to picture people as my friends and I was trying not to make enemies. And I was just like, oh, it's not that bad. Um, I'm okay. But I didn't realize how much of an effect it was having on me. Like the fact that I kind of enjoyed soccer, but now I can't play it because I never got the opportunity to play with my friends at school because I was usually bullied out of it. So I think the main reason I didn't tell was because, you know, I was trying to not make enemies with anyone. Um, that was my main reason, I think. But eventually it came to a point where you did have to spill the beans. Yeah. Um, How and when did you do that? I, I, I think I didn't eventually just spill the beans to someone. I think in my own um, self, I kind of didn't just get over it, but I started to take make changes in my own mind and my own thought. And I changed schools and I told my parents that it was a good idea for me to change schools because then I'd leave that environment. And the change of schools Did they realize you were being bullied? That's yes, why you yes, wanted I, to change that, that schools? That is the part where I did spill the beans kind mm -hmm. of. I was like, I, I think I need to change this. And um, even my parents didn't have that much finances to change, but they made a, a really good plan. And I'm so grateful for that. But oh, I got out of the school. How precious. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Did it change? Did your situation change when you changed schools? Yes, most definitely. It was like a complete change. I thought, you know, is this going to be just a restart? I'm not going to be bullied again. But I got there and there was just this respect. And I loved that from the school. It was really amazing. Um, I even left school early to run my own business. But I have nothing wrong with the school. I loved it so much. And I was really respected. And I respected everyone the same way. And it was a... a, a Life changer. Just and I'm sure your school. grades improved as well. Yeah, no, they, they did. They did. I still, I still had my struggles, um, but my grades did improve and it was easier to work in that environment and mm -hmm. things. Uh, and yeah, that was schooling. How did you then get involved in Smart Teens? Okay, so I was, I was involved in Smart Teens because from there I went and saw a chiropractor. I went and did mind power courses with my parents, which I was reluctant to. And then that's where the change happened. I got involved in life saving. And then I became like Victor Ladorum and started getting much more active. And then. Okay, let's take it one step at a yeah. time. You went to a chiropractor, what for? Because uh, this chiropractor, because I mean, my, pros my posture was, was not that great, but he said it's not just about the posture. And he worked on things um, in terms of emotionally with me because he could tell that there because was. Because of that the bullying, past, it had yes, that effect there was on that you. Past, Goodness yeah, from me. the bullying. He could tell that. And I thought. I thought like, you know, why would I need a chiropractor? And then when he said that to me, I was like, wow, he can see just by my posture and how I carry myself that there was that past. And he kind of took that away and he kind of worked that through with me over weeks and weeks. And it was a really good help. So 
that's where the chiropractor uh, came and in. And your self-esteem was yeah, growing with each passing day. Yes. Now, your mom is a pretty dynamic woman. I very, do know her and I know she does amazing work yes. with young people. When she suggested that you join um, Smart Teens, yes. What is going through your mind? Because teenagers don't want to be seen hanging yeah. out with their moms. They don't. Yeah. It's yeah. enough that they live at home with yeah. mom, yeah. but now they've got to be joining a program with mom yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, so, so with that on, on that um, uh, note, I, it was it was a bit. I mean, I thought, okay, I will go because she she asked me to go. But that first course, I just attended. I didn't help or anything. I just attended it. And she ran it with her facilitators, really professional facilitators. Were you meant to, were you meant to be helping her? Were you meant to be attending the course? No, no, no I was just meant to be attending the course. And mm -hmm. so she could kind of show me this is what it's about. And I attended it and it was amazing. I felt I felt like it changed a lot of things in my in my life actually. I mean, I learned about how to study effectively, how to remember things, how to do do all these type of things, change my mindset, visualize the things that I wanted to achieve and it was just in a amazing course for me how long were you and on the course it's it was a two-day course just mm -hmm. two days um and that's that was enough for me to to realize how powerful this course really was and i've done it multiple times i've gone back um i didn't have to go back but by choice i went back to redo it because even if you don't catch something the first time you always learn it on the second time and you learn something new each time because um, the content does change but there's some fundamentals that even you catch on later after doing it again and again and that's what happened with me so smart teens gave you the confidence, yes. gave you back your self-esteem, yes. you felt great about yourself Absolutely. and you were ready to take on the world. Yes, that's, that's what How did the You Dream plane build happen? Why did you believe uh, that you could be a part of this team and make it happen. Okay, so how that happened was um, my mom again, she encouraged me to come along to a book launch of a girl. She was about 14, uh, 15 at the time. She had just written her own book and she was having a launch. I went to the book launch and I met her, her name is Megan. Um, and then I met her and her family. And then that was a year before the, the plan build started. So that's where I got to know her. Then from then I heard from her as a friend that she was doing this project and she was approaching many schools like thousands of kids and from there she and her family shortlisted the kids to about 130 kids uh, sorry i think it was 200 kids did you have to apply yeah uh, so, sorry yes you had to send in a video to a whatsapp to get involved with this project and be chosen to be to go to the selection day to be chosen to be part of the 20 Okay, teenagers. what did the video cover? Okay, so the video said you need to motivate why you wanted to be on the project, what do you expect to get from it, what are you going to give into it, and those type of things. So that basically, why should you be a part of the 20 teenagers that are about to build an aeroplane to fly from Cape Town to Cairo? So um, part of the preparation for that video, yes. I should imagine, involved research. Yes, because you yes. probably needed to know yeah, what you, you were talking about. It, about. Yes. What was the selling point for you and what type of research did you do in preparation of that w video? I mean, uh, so I looked into it, I was, I was thinking, how is that possible? Are we building like a remote control plane or something? <laughs> and then I realized, no, they want to build a plane from a kit. And I, again, that's another thing that I'll mention later when they said it's building from a kit. Um, and I looked into that and I said, what's the whole idea? How is it going to be possible? And they said, no. It's, it's just because the as you speak, I'm wondering yeah, how, how can it possibly be, be yeah. that you're going to build a plane from kit yes. and it's going to be flown from Cape Town to Cairo? Uh, yes. it's, it's, uh, it was mind boggling for I think everyone that applied for that and they wanted to know how is this actually going to take place. Um, and that's that's uh, they didn't give too much details on what the kit's going to be like, how we're going to build it. They just said that they'll give us everything we need to know and the 20 teenagers can arrive there and they'll be given the, the, the uh, accommodation and the food and the drink and the uh, sanitary and all that and then we'll get the kits and the manuals and then we can build the plan together. Uh, the, we'll be broken into teams if we need, we'll be doing team building to keep motivated and that's how we're going to build it. And that's when I said I'm, I'm in and I wanted to apply for it. But then, um, as I said, they wanted you to apply and then go to a selection day. 
and then on that selection day, um, then they would they would run a few different activities to choose who's going to be the 20. What were the activities? Okay, so when we arrived on the selection day, we all had to queue to register, but we soon realized that before even registering, there were people like like judges running around and they were like writing down what people were doing. And even Megan herself, she did something that Richard Branson does. Um, and she went and disguised herself as a normal person because she kind of took away the look of herself, just put on a wig and things look quite real and she went around trying to talk to people but she wanted to be that type of person that talks too much and irritates people and then other people were watching how we responded to that and if we were nice to people and respected people as they are and weren't rude back to her and that type of thing was really interesting how they did that but it was things like that like they said the first thing that happened when we arrived and registered and they called us all there says we don't have enough chairs there's some chairs there and some chairs there but we're not gonna have enough chairs to all sit down we're gonna break we're gonna break now and you guys need to make a plan together to get everyone seated. And everyone did and they, some people helped a little bit more than others and they got the chairs together and they all, some of us sat on each other's laps or half on a chair and made a plan. And people watched that and the judges watched that and they wrote down because we all had our own numbers. I remember mine was eight and they watched that and they wrote it down. And that was really interesting. And then they ran like leadership games and things and saw who took charge, you know, who was taking charge in these groups that they split up. And then they were running interviews. There was like five people being interviewed at a time. And they were saying, they were asked the type of questions like, how are you gonna survive in these conditions? It's on an airfield, it's gonna be cold. You're gonna be able, it's not a, like a holiday camp. You're gonna be working and building this plane. And those are the type of questions they asked. And for me, I made a joke because the, the, the room was so quiet when I walked in for my interview. And then they said, you know, why do you want to be involved? And my answer was, well, my mom kind of said it would be a good idea. So I got involved <laughs> and everyone laughed. I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was uh, something like that. Okay, let's like that go, let's go yeah. for an ad break. Yeah. I'm talking to Merit Tyson. He's one of a group of 20 young people, teenagers at that, uh, who got together on a project. It was the U Dream plane build. And of course, uh, that plane um, flew from Cape Town to Cairo. And he's going to talk more about the build, what it's done for him, how it's changed him as a person, and the events that has followed there on. Don't go away. Merit Tyson is my guest. He's 18 years old with a group of 19 other teenagers. They got together. This was a special project and they built a plane which flew from Cape Town to Cairo. When did the flight happen? Uh, the flight happened uh, in, I think it was, oof, I think it was de December, December that they took Last flight. year. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's when it was meant to take Did part. you want to, even though you were involved with the building of the plane, hoping that you'd be on the flight as well, or was that now a separate set of young people that were going on the flight? Yeah, no, that was, that was a separate set of uh, young people that went on the flight. Um, those that um, could get funding or sponsored or anything could go on the flight as well and just experience it and go to the different countries that they visited um, and experience the culture there mm -hmm. and kind of motivate people and say, you know, if we can do it, you can do it. Just, just dream and Absolutely. just learn that you can, you can achieve anything if you put your mind to it. And so it is yeah. true what people tell you or tell us all the time. If you can dream it, you can be it yes. or you can achieve it. What Absolutely. are you hoping to get out of being a part on this project? Um, I was, I mean, I, I probably thought what a lot of people thought as well as imagine I can tell people I built an airplane. Still, like a lot of us were like, is it, is it really true? Like, could we do this uh, just as teenagers? And that's, that's what I kind of wanted to do. I wanted to go and experience this. Um, less about what I could tell other people and more like think to myself, if it's all about I, achievement, yeah, isn't it? Like, I have achieved I've this. I've built an airplane and mm -hmm. I've never thought like I could barely put together a little craft airplane myself. And now with a bunch of teenagers that are motivated and all leaders, we could put this together just with manuals and go through these 100 page manuals and things um, and, and work together and build this plan. That's that's what I kind of wanted to get out of it, just the experience and be able to, to say to people and myself that I've done this. I think that's what I wanted to get out of it. How long did it take? How much time did you have to put aside? Was it on weekends only? No, so what happened was they kind of based, <coughs> excuse me, they kind of based it around times when a lot of the schools were on holidays and they said, we're gonna do this over uh, three weeks, but it took us two weeks to do it. 
um, we kind of just got together. We would build from Monday to Friday, then we'd take two days break, the Saturday and Sunday, get back Monday to Friday, and we finished it within two weeks on the Friday. And that's that's the time frame that we did it in. I mean, the airplane factory takes about three months, but I mean, they are building many at a time, but I thought it was amazing that we could do it in two weeks as teenagers. It was really fantastic. Highlights and lowlights or challenges, achievements during this period that you were busy with this group of people. Yes. So with the group of people, that's an, that's an interesting topic because remember with the selection process, um, they wanted to choose leaders. Everyone there is a leader. Um, that's, what, that's the whole goal of who was supposed to be on the project. And you can think to yourself, everyone's a leader. How are we going to work in teams? Because everyone wants to say something and do something. And Too many I think, chiefs and yes, not enough Indians. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a great lesson that I learned in this project is I like had this moment where I stepped back and I realized everyone here also wants to lead. I need to know when to follow, when to step back and listen. And when it's my time, when there's something that I know well that I can step up and lead. But you've got to know when to follow. I think that's a great, a great part of learning to lead is knowing when to follow as well. And I guess the skill that you're honing there is patience yes, and respect. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, just respecting, exactly, just respecting the other, the other teens and letting them have their chance to lead and letting me have my chance when I'm ready to do it. And those are the type of things, I mean, there weren't many challenges as a, I was also, a, I'm still also a scout, so that helped me a lot because I've been camping before um, and I was like, wow, there's air conditioning in these tents and people were like, wow, we're sleeping in tents, that's hard. And I was like, wow, there's air conditioning. So there was, there, those, that wasn't much of a challenge for me. Um, I think the challenge was, the one challenge for myself was um, they had an Indian woman cooking the food and it was always hot and I was like, oof, I can't eat the hot food. But you know what, I, I still, I was grateful for the food because I didn't pay a cent to be on this project mm -hmm. and I was so grateful for that food and I was so grateful for what I was able to achieve and say that I've done with this plan. Apart from the achievement yes. that one day you could tell your children yes. that this is what I've achieved, did you, in the process of the build, yes. uh, perhaps have a change of mind or a change of heart as far as your own future is concerned? Because yes. when, you know, prior to the build, you probably had ideas about what you want mm. uh, to study for yes. going forward. Yes. Did being on this build change your mind? Yes, I, I think, I think um, nothing that I've, that I've acted on as of yet, but definitely I could see that people were starting to push for their PPL and what that is is a private pilot's license. Um, a lot of them, a lot of these teenagers wanted to get involved in the aeronautical science and those type of things. And I thought that would be an amazing thing. And I said, I actually want to start funding up my time to get my PPL and start um, pushing for that. I think that that was amazing. Like I, wanted, I went home and downloaded a flight simulator again as well and I started flying around and I was really inspired after this project. Like, you know, I want to fly as well, not just build it. And I think that would be a great combo to be able to build the plane and also fly. So yes, it did, it did instill a few more, um, a bit more desire to fly and push for my PPL or maybe study aeronautical science or those type of things. What are you doing currently? Uh, currently, I'm just working um, on maintenance and, and construction. Uh, I'm working with my dad for a company called Imagine Projects. That's what I'm doing at the moment. Um, I would like to, to do a bit more work on that, but definitely since the project, I would like to get my uh, pilot's license afterwards as well. Are and you working on it though? I, I'm, I'm trying to do a lot of uh, flight simulator things and work on it, yes, most definitely. Something sad happened after the build of the plane. Yes. Um, the, what do you call it, the partner plane? Yeah, or the support plane. The support plane yes. uh, was involved in a terrible tragedy yeah. and there were people who were killed there. Yes. You obviously got to know the people mm. during the project. I did, yeah. Who were the people that were killed? And um, it must have really, really had quite an effect on you and the rest of the people okay. who yeah. worked on the build. Yeah. And of course, our hearts go out to yeah. their families. Yes. Uh, we wish them strength during this very, very dark period yes. in their lives. Yeah. So the, the two people that, that unfortunately lost their lives was uh, a man named Werner. He was one of the people that helped from the beginning to the end of the project. He was there on the selection day and he was there flying with the support plane and things. Um, he was a great, a great help and a great black like, part of the project. And the other was actually Megan, the founder of the project's father. He was unfortunately in the plane as well and the two of them had the accident. It was quite unfortunate. Um, in terms of effect, 
the it was only the support plane the plane that the teenagers built showed no problems from Cape Town to Cairo and back but the support plane unfortunately had the issues I think only coming back from Cairo they started to have issues with the fuel and the transponder I believe it was and oil as well so they even had to stop the plane at one point um, the support plane and then fly the bold plane that we created um, by itself and they left the support plane in one country then uh, Des was uh, Megan's father's name and Verna they flew back commercially to go with the engineers to fly the support plane back the engineers did what they could on the plane even the the two pilots that were going to fly it were satisfied with the repairs uh, as far as I've heard and then they decided they're going to fly it now and I think it was, I don't know how long the time was, but very shortly after takeoff, they had Take another... Takeoff from where? Uh, I think they took off from, it was either Ethiopia or... Um, one of the African one countries. Of the, one of the African countries uh -huh. flying past Tanzania. They, it, was, it, was, it was shortly after taking off that the plane um, produced a fire and that kind of burnt the plane down and I think it crashed on Tanzanian um, land. And yeah, so it was a very unfortunate accident. And in terms of effect on us, I think that the two of them, they both knew that the plane that we built landed safely in, in Cape Town and the project was finished. And they both passed away doing what they both loved the most. That mm -hmm. was their passion, was flying. And I think that more than sadness or, or grief, of course, there's lots of that, but inspiration and legacy that they left behind, I think it's more of a reason to push for the project Absolutely. and just make sure that it goes further than to stop and, and you know, um, be saddened about it. I think it's a really good um, push to, it's an unfortunate um, way of motivation, but it's a lot of motivation for that project is the two of them. What lives. happens to the plane now that's in Cape Town and what's the next step as far as this project is concerned? So the last that I heard was the, the, project, the, the, the plan for the project is to grow a bit bigger and create more of these projects where teenagers can get together and, and have a selection process again and choose 20 teenagers again to build more planes and get them to go to other countries and inspire other kids and realize just like us the teenagers that if we can do something like this really anyone can it's a very overrated statement when someone says you know if you can do anything if you believe everyone's like okay yeah you know but if you think about it you really can oh absolutely uh, you really can and i think that's the one thing that stands out with this project is pushing that statement and saying you really can would you know what's going to happen to the plane that you guys built um i'm not sure i believe that the the sponsors and some of the the builders of the plane have certain rights and ownership towards the plane and it will be able to i, th I think that the use the main use of it is going to be used for training pilots um oh, to, wow. yeah, training young pilots to get their pilot's license i believe that's the main purpose behind that specific plane that's been built and then of course the sponsors and other people that helped pay for the plane have their own rights and, and, and ownership of the plane they can fly it um, within their certain time slots and things but the main thing is to train other young pilots it's been absolutely fascinating talking yes, to you you, you started out by talking about being bullied yeah. and just look at your journey it is amazing journey. what an amazing journey you've had and look how you've grown um, very confident, um, high in self-esteem, and I know you know that whatever you apply your mind to can and will become a reality. So thank you indeed for sharing all of those words of wisdom and um, can't wait to perhaps uh, track you down in a year's time to see where you're at and what you've achieved. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the talk. My pleasure entirely. And there you have it. Merritt Tyson dreamed big and look what he's achieved. Bullied at school and went on for quite a while till eventually he decided that he needs to change schools and just see where his journey has taken him. And of course, the belief and support of an amazing mother, amazing parents. That's where we leave it today. Uh, we do hope this young man has inspired you and start believing. I know it's cliched, but start believing in the, uh, in the saying that you can be anything you dream or you can achieve anything you dream about achieving. All you need to do is to apply your mind, believe in yourself and apply your mind. And on that note then, we thank you for being with us. Take care on the roads as always. Till the next time, it's Assalamu Alaikum and Khudafiz from me, Julie Ali. <laughs>
جمعت الخير هلا جمعت الخير هلا